Okay. Starting with Mesa Verde. Before we get into Mesa Verde, though, uh, I wanted to just show you uh, basically the North American uh, indigenous peoples uh, kind of a layout of what we could kind of consider First Nations layout. Um, so just as a reminder, we had uh, or we will have the Great Serpent Mound, which is in Ohio, which is around here. You've already had the Hyde Painting and the Sundance, which is uh, would be located in uh, Wyoming, as I recall, which is around here. You've had the Transformation Mask, which would have been from up here. And now we're getting into um, uh, the uh, Mesa Verde, uh, which would be from this area of the world. Um, they'll note in a, another video that you know, the distinction between U.S. and, you know, further into what's now Mexico, those are artificial distinctions. So just keep that in, or, you know, they're distinctions that are contemporary. They're not uh, natural to the original peoples who occupied this land, right? Um, so starting with Mesa Verde, uh, so we have an image here. Uh, we can see we have a number of uh, structures. They are both residential and uh, ritualistic uh, in, in significance. That's um, mostly residential, though, uh, built into a, a cliff, uh, into the side of a mountain, essentially, where there is um, space on the side of a mountain. We have the, the living spaces created here, uh, clearly constructed with, with, with stone, specifically sandstone, also with uh, kind of mud mortar, uh, and there are also, you can see um, the sides of, or the, the beginnings of um, branches that are used to kind of um, straighten, solidify uh, the, the structure, make it more stable. Um, there is a UNESCO video that I am linking here. Uh, I've got it on the Google Classroom. So when you watch it, I'm not going to show it here, but when you watch it, you uh, it's kind of a general introduction. Uh, kind of consider it as an intro, but do pay attention to what they say about, in particular, about what, what they say about the weather and the benefits of this site as it comes to the weather. weather. Also pay attention to how the... Um, how the buildings were constructed. Uh, that's information that's good here. Uh, so Mesa Verde means green table. So we have flat topped mountains. This is located in Colorado, um, which was not Colorado then, right? Uh, so we have these mountains with the, with you know growth on top. This is going to be important because the um, ancient uh, Puebloan, the Anasazi people who occupied this area, they were farmers. And so they used to farm up here uh, and, and sometimes live up here, but then also sometimes live in the, um, in the structures uh, in the side of the mountain. So uh, typically uh, Anasazi uh, constructions uh, are, are done a little bit differently. What Cliff Palace, which is part of the um, part of the Mesa Verde uh, construction has stone and mud mortar and wooden beams as opposed to just Adobe, which is which is what have been typical. Uh, so that's part of why we're noting this one in particular, Cliff Palace as part of Mesa Verde. Uh, so the Anasazi, the ancient Puebloan people occupy what's called, identified as the Four Corners, uh, Four Corners because now they're known as, you know, the areas of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. Um, so uh, this area uh, began to really be occupied. I know the date on this uh, goes back to, you know, 450, but really, uh, it really begins to get occupied around 1000, uh, 1100 CE, maybe a little bit later. I don't know why uh, College Board starts you at 400 CE, except to say that there were people occupying the area but not necessarily uh, like the Cliff Palace area, which is what we're really focused on, uh, either the constructions on the, on the sides of the mountain. Um, so here there are, uh, in, in the Cliff Palace, there are about 600 structures. Uh, as I mentioned, they're residential and ritualistic and also there's storage. So it really is kind of a living and worship space. 
Um, Cliff Palace is the best preserved of them. Uh, and the Poilers occupied the area, as I said, from around 450. So even though we're really focused on the structure of Cliff Palace, uh, in particular, the whole area has been occupied since around 400. Uh, so as I've mentioned before, they were farmers. Uh, so uh, living in the sides uh, offer you protection from the elements and also nearness to your crops, right? Uh, if you watch the video about uh, the UNESCO video about the weather, you'll understand why protection from the elements is particularly important. Uh, just another view, right? We can see that that mud mortar and the brick, the sandstone, as opposed to just using adobe. Uh, and one of the important parts of the organizational structure to uh, Cliff Palace was something called a kiva, a kiva, um, which is how the these spaces were organized. Um, a kiva is a circular subterranean room that uh, is used for ritual, uh, for religious ritual. It would have had a wood beamed roof. You don't see, uh, you'll just see a picture of a kiva in just a moment. You won't see a roof on it. Uh, it would have been removed so you can look into it. Uh, it has some support columns, uh, a banquette, basically just a, a seating around it made of stone, a vent, a fire pit, et cetera, et cetera. The, one of the important parts that you need to know about the kiva or the important part about, that you need about the kiva, which makes it really the ritualistic, brings in the ritualistic religious aspect, is what's called a sipapu. Uh, Sipapu is this small hole opening, you'll see it in just a second, uh, which uh, in the kiva, on the floor of the kiva, which was understood to be like a portal to the other world that the ancestors would have been able to um, uh, emerge uh, from uh, in order to kind of communicate with uh, current people, right? So connection to the ancestors, communication to the ans with, with the ancestors is really important. Uh, kivas are still used today. Obviously, nobody's occupying Cliff Palace, but they're still used in uh, P uh, Puebloan um, cultures today, which are still around, like the Hopi. Um, yeah, my sister-in-law uh, actually... She's not Native American, but her mother worked very closely with a number of, um, with the Hopi tribes. And she actually spent some time living on, uh, on or very close to a uh, reservation and confirmed for me that kivas are still used. Uh, so the living, I said they were the organizational units. Uh, the living spaces uh, kind of fan out from the kivas. They're kind of the central spot. So there are a number of kivas in the areas and the living spaces kind of, you know, come out from, from there. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So let's look at one. Here's a kiva subterranean, right? Uh, so this is where people would sit on the banquette. Uh, there's a vent, obviously, if you've got a roof on this and you got a fire, you got to have some, uh, air movement, right? And the deflector to keep the, you know, the fire from getting burned out. There's the sipapu. There's that portal that the spirits of the ancestors would be able to come out of and communicate to the people in this ritualistic space. Okay. Uh, how to get in and out, uh, both retractable ladders. And as you saw on the UNESCO video, uh, uh, sometimes kind of divots in the uh, kind of toe holds uh, on the side of the cliff, depending on where you were, but certainly the retractable ladders, even within the structure itself. Uh, you can't, I don't know if you can see any, you'll be able, if you watch the video, which you should, oh, you can see a number of kivas here, kiva, 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 right? So you can, kiva, kiva, right? So you can see they're not just, um, and, and, the, and the residential space is coming out from the kiva, right? Uh, so, uh, it's not just like one Kiva in the structure, right? Uh, so as you're watching the Khan Academy video, Khan Academy video, again, which I'm going to link, uh, pay attention to, uh, the size and the topography of the site. Um, as I mentioned, the kind of the artificial distinction between Mesoamerican and native North American peoples, um, how it was constructed. The UNESCO video does some of that as well, where and when it was constructed and maintained and occupied. And also the information about the excavations. Uh, I put that in quotes, right? Okay. So yes, when, after you watch that, uh, you may ask yourself, well, I don't understand why 
the uh, taking these artifacts from these sites is such a big deal. Um, you may be at saying to yourself, um, we have artifacts from ancient Egyptians. We have bodies of ancient Egyptians. Uh, why can we look at those in a museum and artifacts from ancient Egypt in a museum and not this culture, right? Here's the big gigantic difference. The ancient Egyptian culture is gone, right? Nobody worships Ra anymore, right? The religious traditions of, for example, the Hopi or, you know, or the people, uh, the, the Puebloan people, right? Our peoples, they're still around and still alive and still practiced. And so when you dig up an ancestor, that has a serious effect and is incredibly offensive and uh, world potentially world shattering to those people. So that's why it's different, right? And that's why you know, like masks, you know, taking the taking of masks and the using of masks in inappropriate ways is also so troubling because this is a current living culture. Right. So it's it's not gone. These people are still here and they're still living and worshiping and they have still have these beliefs. And so it, to do, you know, to kind of take and put on display, that's why it's so troubling and offensive. Um, OK, so uh, the next video will be about the Great Serpent Mound. Thank you. Which is in Ohio.